So we have the nice topic, the, uh, the light topic of the day, how will crypto uh, help protect human rights under dictatorships? Um, we have 30 minutes. Uh, my name is Jason Yanowitz. I'm one of the co-founders of BlockWorks Group. I'm also going to introduce the other folks here because it is such an interesting topic and we are tight on time. So uh, Alex Gladstein is the Chief Strategy Officer at the Human Rights Foundation. He's also a guest lecturer at Singularity University. Um, he's written in Atlantic, uh, BBC, CNN, NPR, uh, Wall Street Journal, Time, and now is featured at San Francisco Blockchain Week. So pretty big deal. Um, Jill Carlson is, uh, came from the, the dark side, as we say in crypto, which is Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, uh, emerging markets trader, uh, now the co-founder of the Open Money Initiative, a nonprofit that produces research um, and insights into how money is managed in um, countries that are experiencing like hyperinflation and capital controls. Um, and she's now a principal at Slow Ventures. And then Nevin Freeman to my right is the co-founder of Reserve, which is one of the leading stablecoin projects in the space. Uh, I think he's too humble to say this, but after reading his articles and listening to his talks and his podcasts uh, over the past week or so, I think he, uh, I'm going to dub him as a stablecoin expert. So um, I want to start it off with uh, Alex, actually. Alex, you, unlike most people in the room uh, who probably were interested in Bitcoin and then into Bitcoin and then became interested in human rights, you were interested in human rights and then got into Bitcoin. Um, of all, actually, why don't we back it up a little bit? Let's, let's go non-crypto for a second. Why don't we talk about money? Um, and monetary freedom, and talk. I, I want to hear from you. Why is monetary freedom so important? And would you say that monetary freedom is more important than uh, than freedom of speech right now? Sure. I think that it's um, kind of puzzling that the human rights industry or the human rights community doesn't really pay attention to currency and money and and economics in a, in a primary way. And certainly, that was my experience for many years uh, working as a human rights activist and meeting human rights activists from around the world, uh, money and the way that we transacted was never like a topic of important conversation. It was like always just something on the side. And then a couple of years ago, uh, learning about Bitcoin really showed me that, that it was actually really, really important. And now I'm starting to look and whether you're looking at uh, in Russia today, where if Mr. Putin doesn't like you, what does he do? He shuts down your bank account. In China today, how the government is creating its own nefarious, I would say, kind of cryptocurrency that's going to allow real-time surveillance of all their citizens' activities, whether you look at countries like Zimbabwe or Turkey or Iran or... Venezuela, where the government has just printed a lot of money and destroyed the savings of the people, or whether you're even looking at... Um, Areas like Palestine, for example, where people are under like really intense bank controls. Um, I think money is is a really important part of the human rights conversation, and I want to I would break that into like financial freedom and financial privacy, and I think both of them are equally important. So people around the world are going to want to have access to hard money that's not going to be able to be devalued by governments. Number one, and number two, they're going to want to be able to have some sort of level of privacy in their transactions so that they don't fall under the control of like a surveillance state. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, can I get a show of hands really quickly? Uh, how many people feel comfortable explaining or, or feel like they have a good understanding of what's going on in Venezuela right now? Okay. Um, not, that, not that many. Um, we, have, we have at least one Venezuelan here. We have one. There we go. Um, two. Two. Uh, Jill, you are our, I'll call you an expert here, maybe. I, I won't use that word, maybe. But uh, Jill, you, you know more than... Uh, most of us about what's going on in Venezuela through your work with the Open Money Initiative. Um, Alex just talked about what's going on in China and like Bitcoin is used to evade government controls over capital and, and Putin can take a journalist's bank account and, and basically just wipe them off the financial system. Can you give a high level primer about what's going on in Venezuela? And then the follow up question to that um, is going to be just, I, I want you to talk about, you, you've spoken to the, the farmers and the people who are used, like, you know, the women who are putting money in their hair across, going across the border. So you've been on the ground. So if you could just give a high level primer on what's going on in Venezuela and then talk about what's actually happening on the ground with Bitcoin. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll give a little context first how I got into all of this, which was, um, you know, as Jason mentioned, I started out my career uh, trading emerging markets, trading Latin American debt. Um, so I got to know a decent number of folks in uh, Venezuela, at the time Argentina as well, also had capital controls, high rates of inflation, nothing compared to what Venezuela is experiencing today. But I, I would work with these people who were on the ground there, and they started to say to me at some point in 2012, 2013, um, you know, we're using this thing called Bitcoin to get our money out of the country. And that was the first sort of what I would call legitimate introduction I had to Bitcoin, the whole crypto space. And that's what really piqued my interest and drew me in and has remained my focus um, even now, six, seven years later of my time in the space. And that was in part what prompted the founding of the Open Money Initiative. And so the Open Money Initiative, we go on the ground to places like Venezuela to get an understanding of where and how Bitcoin is being used, but also what other financial tools and technologies are being used. And so our first focus, as I've mentioned, has been Venezuela. Now, if I talk to my sort of average peer, you know, someone who's uh, decently well-informed, you know, in Silicon Valley or New York, et cetera, and say, oh, are you aware of what's going on in Venezuela? They'll generally say, like, yeah, it sounds like a total tragedy, like, you know, mismanagement of the government, whatever. But what most people tend not to understand, unless you've spent time there, unless you're from there, et cetera, is that Venezuela... 50 years ago, was one of the wealthiest nations in the world, one of the wealthiest economies on the planet. Um, it's a petro state, it's very wealthy in terms of its oil reserves. And even up until 10 years ago, things were still pretty okay. Like you talk to Venezuelans, they're some of the hardest working people in the world, um, some of the most well-educated. And there are still elements of it today where you can see like this was until recently a thriving country and even a thriving economy. Um, you know, people there have access to the internet. People have self, people have smartphones, not just cell phones, smartphones. Uh, the online banking rate of the population in Venezuela is actually higher than it is in the United States. As a percentage of population, more people there use online banking systems. Um, but what's happened is over the last 10 odd years, the government there has mismanaged the economy and the monetary system to such a point where people are now facing all kinds of challenges. And hyperinflation is really the tip of the iceberg when we talk about it. So hyperinflation, rates of 10 million percent inflation year on year. What does that look like in practicality? That means that if you're an average 30-year-old and you've been saving your entire life, you're left still just with dollars because your money is melting in your bank account. Single digits of dollars. Um, that means if you own a shop, if you're a shop clerk, you have to literally run around the shop and be constantly updating prices because you can't keep up with the 10 million percent inflation. Now, why don't those shop clerks just start using US dollars as the denomination, right? This money system is broken. Well, that's what I mean when I say hyperinflation is the tip of the iceberg, because actually the government has mandated that you have to use boulevards, you have to use the local currency there. And so you end up in this hellish nightmare situation where not only has your system failed you, but you're also trapped within it. And so that's the context, that's the situation that we've gone on the ground to examine and understand how we as builders, as entrepreneurs, can build tools and products that can actually help. And that I know is what Reserve is trying to do and there are several other projects in the space that I'm very happy and grateful to say are also focused on this. Um, so Jill just talked a little bit about why, why things like Bitcoin are helpful um, and then at the end mentioned Reserve. Um, we talk a lot about People in crypto love to say that you know Bitcoin's amazing because folks in Venezuela can hold it and and hedge against well not even hedge but use it to protect against hyperinflation. Um, Nevin, can you talk a little bit about? I, I don't really want to spend this time getting into like exactly what Reserve is and like how it differs from every single stablecoin out there, but rather I'd love to hear um, why why do we need a stablecoin? 
How does it help the people in Venezuela? How does it, let's, let's start with there. How does it help the people in Venezuela? Sure. Um, so so if, if, you're, if you're in Venezuela um, and you're trying to escape the inflation of the boulevard, you're, you're, you really want dollars. Like generally speaking in, in many Latin American nations, and actually in, in many other nations in the world where currencies are going down, the dollar is the thing that people want. Um, uh, you know, when people are changing prices in their shops, um, like Jill's talking about, they, they have an idea in their mind of what the thing is worth in dollars. So everything, everything sort of effectively is dollarized. Um, and actually most of the wealthy people had their, got their wealth into dollars a long time ago. Um, and, the, and then actually, so, so you mentioned that you have to use the boulevard. That's kind of not true anymore. Things are changing quite fast and people are starting to do a lot of transactions in cash USD. Um, and so, so from our perspective, you know, if we're going to try to create an electronic payment mechanism that an economy can be run on, that people can use to get money in and out and so on, um, really the dollar is the thing that people want. Um, and so, so yeah, so essentially from that perspective, you know, a dollar pig stable coin, it's, you know, kind of feels boring to us, but um, we think that that's the most straightforward thing um, to offer. Um, and so, you know, the challenge is with, with any situation like this is how do you get from like zero to one? How do you start um, an ecosystem? How do you create liquidity between the existing currency and something new like this? Um, and so um, we are just getting into the, the hard challenge of bootstrapping a market between the boulevard and our dollar peg cryptocurrency, making it so people can actually purchase the cryptocurrency with a bank transfer, with the boulevard bank transfer in an Android app. Um, and um, yeah, I guess we can talk about more of that if you want, but that's that's kind of our basic take. Great. Um, so um, another question back at you. Uh, there are a bunch of com uh, countries that have tried to peg their currency to another currency. Uh, some have done it successfully. A lot of them have failed. Um, there are also companies in the crypto space. Uh, dozens of stable coins, right? Some have failed. Um, some got really big and raised a ton of money. Others are like still going on, Tether, Maker, stuff like that. Um, uh, the question I want to ask you is, it's kind, of, it's kind of a tough one. I'm not sure if you've thought too much about this, but what happens, you're in a unique opportunity right now because you, if this works out for reserve, you can onboard the next 100 million people into crypto. You can onboard a billion people into crypto if this really does work out, as I know it is your vision. But it hasn't successfully worked out so far. What, what happens if you fuck this all up? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, and if you look at the history of exchange rate pegs, um, they get fucked up pretty frequently, actually. Um, and, and the basic way that, that happens is if you try to back um, a peg to another currency without full reserves, then you can occasionally enter you know, monetary economic situations um, where, where that peg gets attacked. Um, I'll sort of like gloss over the details, but essentially, um, you know, if you're trying to back a peg with less than full backing, it often falls apart. And so what's sort of been observed over time is um, if you have an exchange rate peg that has full backing, um, this is called like a currency board regime, where it's just like, let's say you're pegging to the dollar, you have 100% backing in US dollars, so that the currency is basically just a virtualization of US dollars, and it's fully redeemable, that tends to work. Um, like if you look at the history of exchange rate pegs, those are the cases where you never see the thing falling apart. An even more extreme version of this is just full dollarization, right? So in, in some economies, um, they'll just fully switch over to using US dollars um, or some other currencies, but usually US dollars. And that's actually considered to be the safest thing uh, because you can never go back on a commitment there. So if you fully switch to using the US dollar, then you can never decide later, ah, oh, you know, I guess we'll spend this money on something else. I guess we'll, you know, spend this on a social program or what have you, which tends to happen in countries like Argentina. Um, you know, had they dollarized, arguably things would have gone much better. So from our perspective, if you're going to make a pegged cryptocurrency, um, it, should, it should be fully backed um, to avoid this possibility. And um, I, I think that there are prominent stablecoin projects in the crypto world today that are attempting novel um, economic mechanisms that if they work could be really beautiful and really cool. And we thought about a lot of those ourselves, but ultimately we decided it's really dangerous to do that because with a stable coin, you're not appealing to people who are putting in, you know, an amount of money that hopefully they're allowed to lose, you know, they're speculating, hoping it's going to go up. You're talking about people who are putting their savings in it, like, you know, running their business with it. Um, and so if that collapses and goes to zero or even, you know, gets cut in half, that could be like super, super bad for a huge number of people. Not to, imagine, not, not, not to mention the sort of like 
terrible mark on the cryptocurrency like revolution that that would be, right? So if if the first like you know even even 10 million or, or, or 20 million people who are like using crypto for real for their lives end up losing half or all of their money. Think about what that's gonna do to the regulatory situation. Like, you know, Facebook just saying they're gonna create a cryptocurrency causes this huge freak out. Imagine if there was actually this like concrete case of us having like fucked all these people over. That would be really, really terrible. So uh, I do lose sleep over this. I think that, um, Actually, the industry probably needs to figure out some way to, to sort of self-regulate which stablecoin projects are brought into the world. Um, I haven't figured out a way of making that happen in practice. Um, I tend to think that if we could rally the exchanges to sort of shun stablecoins that have stupid designs, that would be the right thing to do. Um, uh, but haven't made that happen yet. But that, that's my take on your question. Awesome, thanks. Um, Alex, back over to you. Um, you talk a lot about the separation of technology and state. So in the US, right, there's a... Governments can try to regulate tech companies, but oftentimes it doesn't work out too well. Uh, but you hop, you know, you hop over to China, and things like WePay uh, or WeChat are being used as like these like super apps to consume everyone's data. And then now they're experimenting with like social engineering and stuff like that. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by the separation of state and technology, and why, why it's so important, and why you're focusing on it right now? Yeah, I mean, I think I just because we have so little time, I really want to answer the question that we're we're here. Yeah, how will cryptocurrencies help protect human rights under dictator dictatorial regimes? Most of them won't. Um, there are a couple of traits that you would need in a cryptocurrency for to actually help somebody who lives under dictatorship. Number one, it's got to be a parallel economy, so it, it has to not be attached to the local currency. So it's got to be some escape valve for people as their own currency is crumbling. So whether that be something like Bitcoin or perhaps something that's pegged to maybe the dollar. I mean, this is like number one. The second thing is probably privacy in some aspect. There's got to be a way for you to use this thing where you're not going to get arrested. So I think that any serious project that is aiming to help people has to, number one, um, be a way for people to get into a different asset whether it be Bitcoin or the US dollar, most likely. Um, and number two, it, it cannot have KYC or AML. This is really important. And in America, we think of KYC and AML as like really good things. Like you gotta play by the rules. In Northern Europe, you gotta play by the rules. You cannot have KYC or AML in your product and, and credibly say that you're gonna help somebody living under a dictatorship. Not gonna happen. So these are revolutionary tools. They're going to be illegal in the countries eventually that you are seeking to help people in. There's no way you're gonna be able to work with regular to help people under dictatorships with cryptocurrency. You're going to be committing revolution, basically. And that's why it's very fortunate that we don't know who Satoshi is um, for, for many reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, this, is not a, um, this is not a sort of like corporate uh, mission here. This is quite radical and quite revolutionary. But if you're going to give people who live under dictatorships or broken economies money that they can actually use, it has to be independent from the local ecosystem and and it absolutely has to give them some sort of uh, privacy so that would be like my answer to the uh, the question why we're here and to piggyback on that you know I would call out this kind of a miracle product that's existed for the last seven or eight years which is local bitcoins if you're not familiar with local bitcoins go to localbitcoins.com check it out play with it in the United States, it's become kind of known as like, oh yeah, that sketchy website where like a lot of my friends bought their first Bitcoin back in 2012 because that was the only option back then. Um, again, in the United States, it's frequently known as a website where you can go on, find someone who will literally like meet you on a street corner or at the corner store or in a cafe and sell you Bitcoin for cash. Now. There are use cases that you can come up with around that for why and who and whatever would want to use that in the United States or in other countries where you know we do live in these regulatory regimes. But I can tell you in places like Venezuela, in places like Iran, in places where there are harsh environments in terms of dictatorships, in terms of closed economies, in terms of restrictions on what you can do with your money. Um, this is a game changer. And the way that it gets used there is actually quite different from the ways that we think about a product like this being used in the United States, where it's often actually not meeting someone on the street corner. It's often bank-to-bank -bank transfers, even, um, which doesn't actually address the privacy issue. Uh, but 
when there are no perfect tools, you kind of take what you can get. And Local Bitcoins has offered a tool as an escape valve, as Alex said, for many, many people in these countries. Now, Local Bitcoins, it's important to note, they've been able to offer this because they have not, to date, complied with all of the KYC AML regulations that we in the United States might expect from an exchange like this. And they've been able to do this to date. They've been able to work with regulators and make sure that they understand sort of the use cases and how they fit into these frameworks, et cetera. But that's starting to change. So localbitcoins.com, now if you go on it in the United States, they do ask for KYC AML information. That, thank goodness for the people on the ground in Venezuela, is not yet the case there. But with the pressure of EU regulators, of US regulators, et cetera, that's starting to change. And so to Alex's point around KYC AML, this was one of the last remaining tools that people could use in these countries. And as that starts to go away, we need to start to rethink how we interact with regulatory frameworks as we build products. So I, I have to respond to this because I thought about this the way you guys just described it before I got into this project, and now I think that you're wrong um, on two counts. So, so one is that um, uh, with, a, with a thing like, we're building a, a network like local bitcoins, and the problem, um, and this, this happened with RTM, is when you go on local bitcoins to trade, um, either you're giving your bank account info to the other person or they're giving it to you because a bank-to-bank -bank transaction has to happen. And in Venezuela, when you do that, you include your government ID number. So it's like giving your bank account and government ID number, which makes it, you can just go on the local Bitcoin webpage as an authority and like offer to trade with these people and then just get all of their identity information. And indeed information. that happens, yeah. That, that happens. This has happened on ARTM. People have been arrested for this. If the government wanted to shut it down, I believe it would not be particularly difficult for them to do that because of this feature. And so we're trying to come up with a way of implementing a network where that, that's not the case. But I believe that local Bitcoin exists because it's being allowed to exist, not because it's censorship resistant in that way. Number two is that submitting AML KYC information, submitting your personal information, it's number one, it's clear that people are already willing to do that. They're doing that on the website to trade. The, you know, the, someone in Venezuela submitting that information and having it be seen by, you know, the Finnish government or whatever it is, um, is fine with them. Like, pe when people sign up to our service, they give us their information. It's not a problem. They don't want the information necessarily shared with the Venezuelan. Name but an exchange it, but it, that will do business in Venezuela. Yeah, like it will be Reserve. a problem. <laughs> people in dictatorships can't, so, but, but, can't but, but, use but that, You have braver that. lawyers but, but, but that, than but that problem, 99% of the lawyers but that problem, in the world, I know, let alone in this space. That, that is 100% true. Um, and we worked very hard to recruit those lawyers. Um, <laughs> Congratulations, uh, um, genuinely. But, but, but that's about, that's about, that's not about like whether or not we have AML KYC, that's about being able to make the distinction between someone who is and isn't sanctioned, which is a hard thing to do, and we have to do a lot of work to do that. Um, but, but it's like, it's not about, it's, it's not about whether or not like the, the service can persist, you know, uh, uh, sort of based on whether they're asking for KYC information. But like Bitcoin was literally invented to defeat sanctions. So if you use Bitcoin, you don't have to comply with sanctions. That's the whole point. I understand that. And you're, you'll still need these on and off ramps though, right? Into yeah, or out of Bitcoin. And to your point, it's not just about KYC ML. Like uh, what we're talking about, what I'm talking about anyway, when I discuss this is compliance more broadly, right? And again, props to your lawyers. I know because I've tried to find lawyers who will get comfortable with doing business in Venezuela. And I can tell you, even just the participants that we recruited to our surveys and to our studies, we had a hell of a time paying them. And Venezuela isn't even a country that has a blanket ban on it. It's not even a fully sanctioned country. Um, so then you think about a place like Iran. Mm -hmm. like, you will not find a business in the United States or in Europe who can do business in Iran. In fact, even the SWIFT network. So Iran has sanctions in place by the United States, right? Not by the EU. SWIFT is based in the EU, the SWIFT payments network. This is the thing that we all use every time we go to make an ACH payment or a wire transfer it's going through SWIFT. Okay, SWIFT cannot do business in Iran because the United States government said, SWIFT, if you do business in Iran, we will sanction you. And so that has cut off Iran 
from doing business, even with this EU entity. And so you can start to extrapolate into why something like Bitcoin matters and is so revolutionary, because if you're in this place where you are completely cut off from every financial system around you, this is your only option. Yeah, a friend of mine, uh, her parents, um, her husband's parents live in Iran, her husband's father's very sick, they live in England. There's no way for them to get money to Tehran from London. It's impossible, it's sanctioned. So they send Bitcoin and the family is able to exchange the Bitcoin without providing their information, without going through a KYC service. They're able to exchange it using a local broker into Rial and pay for medical service. This is also the case for young people in Iran who are software entrepreneurs who want to earn money from companies abroad. They've been like, no, nope, you can't do that anymore because you live under sanctions. The unfairness of this is none of these people even got a chance to vote for their government. Iran's a dictatorship, so why do they have to suffer? Why can't they buy iPhones? Why can't they earn money from companies abroad? Why can't they receive money from family? So Bitcoin, because specifically it does not require K KYC or AML, because it is that parallel economy that can break and undermine sanctions, is a lifeline. But that's like the key attribute. Once, once you start complying with these governments, you lose. So do, Alex, do, you, do stable coins have any place? in the future of... Of course. I mean, I just, you know, when it comes to helping people under dictatorships, it's unclear. The most clear example of a stablecoin helping people under dictatorships is Tether. Tether is having a huge impact in China and Russia for people trading remittances. And, you know, that probably won't last forever because I don't think Tether is going to hold its peg for, like, forever. Um, but for while it's around, people are using it. You can use it in a way that doesn't really disclose your identity. So people are work Chinese people are going to Moscow, working in Russia, and sending money back to their family. So I think that's interesting. But probably the biggest way that stablecoins are going to impact humanity are government-issued stablecoins, which are, which are going to be probably bad for human rights. So that's my, my Why? take on that. Why? Because, like, government-issued stablecoin is programmable and surveillable in a way that, like, cash is not. So governments like China are going to start issuing digital money, which essentially is going to be pegged to a particular value. And these things are going to be, like, base money surveillance tools. So they won't even have to go to WeChat to find somebody's information. They can just see it on the ledger. They can see all the transactions. This is why the Chinese government is coming out with the digital yuan. So this is really scary, I think. Um, we have uh, a few minutes left here. Um, I wanted to just kind of give one question. Uh, maybe you could all take 30, 30 seconds, one minute. If there's one sentence to answer this question, how will cryptocurrencies help protect human rights uh, under dictatorships? Alex, you gave a brief one, but if but you want to say By not say playing it again. with the rules. <laughs> say it again. By not playing with the rules of the local government. Yeah, I would say by acting as a tunnel, by acting as a tunnel into and out of these places where there is otherwise no escape. Yep, and so specifically by helping people evade capital controls, I think is is the, is the main the main piece. It's like if you're in a situation where where capital controls don't exist, you can usually get your hands on other foreign stable currencies, um, which which is the case sometimes when we have these high inflation scenarios. So it's like money being messed up plus capital controls that is the the particularly bad situation, and crypto helps you evade this. Awesome, thank you, thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.